Hi, everyone. I'm Gloria Gilman, chair of Philly Neighborhood Networks. Uh, welcome to our latest movie night that we're calling When You Lose the Right to Choose. Uh, tonight, we will delve into the subject of reproduct the current state of reproductive rights, uh, what we can expect from a radicalized Supreme Court, and what we can do to help ourselves and each other in an authoritarian environment. We will review a short film called Abortion Helpline. This is Lisa, uh, that won the 2019 award for best uh, short film at the Philadelphia Film Festival. It also was a nominee of the 2020 Sundance Film Festival. Uh, this will be followed by a presentation from Mara Lang, who is the Director of Client Services at the Abortion Liberation Fund of Pennsylvania. And that will be followed by thoughts from Julie Zapst, who is the Senior Policy Advocate at the ACLU of Pennsylvania. Then we'll open the floor for questions. Uh, if you have a question anywhere along the line, please uh, enter it in the chat and we'll ask them after their presentations. So let's get started. Tim, please cue up the film. Powerful film, very disturbing. Uh, our first guest you will recognize from this film is Mara Lang. She's the Director of Client Services at the Abortion Liberation Fund of Pennsylvania. And she's been in this position since 2016. She oversees the helpline that was featured in the film. She's a social worker by training. Mara will focus uh, more than the film on how ALF, ALFPA and similar abortion fund, funds provide uh, support for pregnant people. That she'll tell us more about the history of the organization's work and uh, ways that abortion access intersects with racial and economic justice. Mara. Hi there, good evening. Um, let's see here. Can you see my presentation, uh, Reproductive Freedom at a Crossroads? Great, okay. All right, y'all, thanks for joining us today um, and for absorbing what you can from that film. Um, so just to expand on what you were able to learn already. Um, so we used to be called Women's Medical Fund. That was our name um, for about 35 years or so. And in the last year, we've recently announced our new name, Abortion Liberation Fund of Pennsylvania. Um, we were founded in 1985. You saw there that the Hyde Amendment was first passed in 76, um, and that gave the states the, options, the option um, to use Medicaid, state Medicaid dollars to pay for abortion care. And some states do that. New York is one of them. Um, New Jersey is one of them. Pennsylvania opted out of that um, and passed our own Medicaid ban in Pennsylvania. And once that went into effect, our fund was created and it was never supposed to be around this long. Um, initially, founders expected it to be a grassroots mutual aid campaign. Surely the Hyde Amendment couldn't exist in perpetuity. It's way too harmful. It's way too devastating. Um, but here we are today. And uh, pretty quickly, we became a staffed fund. Uh, we're one of nearly 100 funds across the country. Everywhere you go, there's a fund for that place. Um, and each fund looks different. This film is an example of um, how we operate and how we operated a few years ago. Things evolve, um, but some funds are all volunteer run. We are um, staffed, but also uh, fund a very large population. Some funds are small. Um, and serve rural populations and everywhere looks different. Um, about 80% of our budget just comes from individual donors. Uh, you saw us kind of educating or mentioning that to someone there. About 20% comes from uh, supportive foundations, but it's really um, dollars from community members to help your neighbors access care that you need. Um, so we have two kind of pillars of our work. 
you just saw a film all about our direct service. That's where we provide funding directly to people seeking care. And then we also uh, do community organizing. So we have organizers on staff who are building, um, right now we're actually building an abortion doula collective to support patients um, who need that care and support, um, but fostering support um, and fostering community amongst folks um, to organize against the bans and against things that um, inhibit our access to abortion care. We have our helpline open five days a week. Um, every day there's funding available and every day we run out. Um, each year we've been lucky to grow and helping um, grow in the amount of money we can disperse to folks needing abortion care. And we've never even like uh, gotten close to meeting the need. Um, so just to go a little bit more into the process there, you saw a glimpse of some of the phone calls that are happening, but a lot is happening outside of that moment in time. So for folks that are accessing abortion funding, particularly with our fund, people discover that they're pregnant. Um, and make a decision about what they want to do with that pregnancy. They might decide to have an abortion, decide to place the child for adoption, or decide to parent. Um, most people have made that decision to have an abortion before they call us. They've called to schedule the appointment, and then they hear the price and realize that's just not possible, and then are then referred to us. There are times we're having conversations with folks who are still in that decision-making process, but almost everybody's very clear. And now it's just a matter of how to make that appointment actually possible. Um, there's plenty of things that go into folks' decision-making, but we know that finances are a very big one. The majority of people we're talking to, at least 70% of the people we talk to are already parents and they know exactly what it takes. Um, to welcome a child into their family, and they know that that's not doable right now. Um, though, of course, there's lots of other things folks are thinking about. Um, so folks have scheduled their appointment, and they know what they want to do, and now their insurance doesn't cover it. Even though Medicaid was designed to support people um, with low income, it's because of the Hyde Amendment that it does exactly the opposite once you're pregnant. Um, so folks will call us for funding. Um, it's a conversation like you saw, um, people are having to make really difficult decisions about how much money they can put towards the appointment themselves. We have never been able to fund um, the whole amount that someone needs. So people are still scraping by in order to get access to their appointment. And in that way, we're able to serve uh, more folks. Um, since COVID, the amount of money that's needed per person is drastically higher. People have far less to work with than they had before the pandemic. Um, and we're finding that we are needing to pledge a higher dollar amount per person for the appointment to be an actual reality for anyone. Um, so yeah, once uh, someone's spoken with us about funding, they have their appointment within days. Um, so it's pretty simple in that way, but also um, a pretty uh, powerful process and a lot to navigate. Amongst this timeline, things you don't see captured here are taking time off from work, um, finding childcare, finding transportation to your appointment, um, and all the other daily things that are made only harder by poverty. Um, so something else I wanted to just kind of highlight or sit within the context of the film that you saw today um, is remembering some things that are constants. Um, abortion has existed since the beginning of time. We've always been having abortions. Um, and it, there was a time before it was used as a political weapon. There was a time before it was um, wielded against the people um, and our freedom over our own bodies. Um, you saw mentioned in the film that abortion restrictions, especially the Hyde Amendment, um, but all of them really are designed to target people who are most vulnerable in the United States, which we know because of racialized capitalism, that's black and brown folks um, who are the first to stand the weight of what these kinds of laws and restrictions can do. 
to your ability to like live and thrive. Um, so when we know that and we recognize the context of those, um, that helps us a lot in understanding what we're up against. So that's about it for me to start. Um, I will shift it back to you, Gloria, for Julie to take over next. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, we'll hear from Julie Zapes, the Senior Policy Advocate at the ACLU of PA, uh, where she focuses on reproductive freedom, gender justice, and LGBTQ and T rights. Uh, a social worker by training, she previously worked in social services and higher education. She would like to share her thoughts tonight on the legal and legislative landscapes uh, post the anticipated SCOTUS decision and how that might affect pregnant people, abortion seekers, and providers in Pennsylvania. Julie? Thanks so much, Gloria. Um, and thanks to everybody for being here this evening. Um, Mara, I really appreciated the look you gave us at what it looks like to seek abortion care right now as things stand in Pennsylvania. Um, I wanted to ground us a little bit more in the current political climate in Pennsylvania and then talk about what I imagine is on everybody's minds, which is what the heck is gonna happen um, following this Supreme Court ruling uh, that we anticipate in the next week. And what does that mean for Pennsylvania specifically? What does that mean for pregnant people here, uh, for folks seeking abortion care and for providers of care? Um, so I wanted to first say that um, abortion has not been easily accessible in Pennsylvania for a lot of people for a long time. Um, we have uh, the Pennsylvania Abortion Control ha Act here in the state, which contains a whole variety of restrictions on abortion care that bear no relationship to patient health and safety. Um, one of the biggest ones you already heard about in the film and from Mara, which is this ban on the use of state Medicaid funding for abortion care. Um, but there are other restrictions that fall hard on patients. Um, so for instance, all patients have to listen to state scripted counseling discouraging abortion. And then after they listen to that counseling, they are mandated to wait 24 hours before they can get a, an abortion. Um, for young folks under 18, they have to have the consent of one parent or go through a process called judicial bypass where a judge um, gives them permission to seek abortion care. Um, so those are the types of burdens that um, patients are up against every day in Pennsylvania when they seek care and have been up against for decades. Um, and then there's also the medically unnecessary requirements of providers. Um, some of you may remember uh, that back in 2011, Pennsylvania passed a trap law, targeted regulation of abortion providers law. Um, and it mandates things like the width of the hallway in your clinic and the type of HVAC system you have to have and other things that again um, are designed to be burdensome and costly for providers but really bear no relationship to patient outcomes. Um, and then there are some uh, facets of the uh, Abortion Control Act that are burdensome for patients and providers. So um, we've all been operating with these challenges for um, years and years and years now. Um, on top of that, um, our state legislature continues to try to further restrict access. So um, just in the last five years or so, um, we have seen both the State House and the State Senate in Pennsylvania pass a ban on abortion after 20 weeks gestation. Um, and there's a lot of reasons folks seek care uh, post 20 weeks. But one of them, of course, is that um, for many folks, that's their first ultrasound um, and the first time that they might find out about fetal anomalies. Um, there was an effort to ban a particular method of abortion called d &E. Um, that's frequently used in later abortion care, um, but really is a decision that should be made by 
you know, medical providers and people who are trained to provide abortion care and not politicians. Um, and then uh, the state house and state senate also passed a, what we call a reason ban. Um, and this is an effort to um, say what are good abortions and what are bad abortions, right? Um, to say, well, there's, there's some reasons that are okay to seek an abortion, but there are some reasons that are not okay. Um, and so we actually already have a sex selection ban um, in statute in Pennsylvania um, that prohibits someone from seeking an abortion based on the sex of their fetus. Um, and there's a whole racialized history behind these sex selection bans. But this particular reason ban that passed the state house and the state senate recently um, was a ban on abortion care um, following a diagnosis of Down syndrome and sought because of that diagnosis. So just wanted to share that even as everybody's panicking about um, the restrictions that we might face going forward and they are daunting and devastating, um, folks have been navigating restrictions in Pennsylvania for a long time. You can move ahead, Mara, with the slide. Um, so I'm going to try to move through this quickly so that we have plenty of time for questions. I think at this point, if you are here and watching this film, you've probably been um, watching pretty carefully what's going on at the Supreme Court in Dobbs uh, versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. Um, so just as a reminder about what this case is, was actually about before it became the big scary abortion case at the Supreme Court, um, Mississippi passed a ban on abortion after 15 weeks. There's only one clinic left in the state, um, which is Jackson Women's Health Organization, and they stepped up to challenge the ban. Um, and it was uh, struck down by the lower courts. The lower courts said, this contravenes Roe, this contravenes Casey, this contravenes, uh, you know, everything um, that has come before. So it's clearly unconstitutional. And so when the US Supreme Court granted cert or agreed to take up the case, observers were really nervous because um, it seemed like they were gunning for Roe. Um, and then you got to oral arguments at um, the Supreme Court, which was in December. And the state of Mississippi essentially didn't even try to argue that a 15 week ban was compatible uh, with Roe and uh, current Supreme Court holdings, they uh, basically were arguing to overturn Roe. Um, and then if that hadn't caught folks' attention, uh, certainly the draft opinion that was leaked last month did. Um, and uh, I think was shocking to uh, everybody who's been following this case closely and, and folks who weren't following it as closely. Um, so I'm gonna give you just a quick overview of what that draft opinion says. Um, it is not set in stone. The opinion that comes down from the Supreme Court later this week or uh, in the you know, last few days of June next week um, could be different, but we don't expect it to be substantially different, unfortunately. Um, so looking at the draft opinion, um, we are expecting that what comes down from the Supreme Court will overturn almost 50 years of precedent by holding that abortion is no longer a fundamental right under the federal constitution. Um, the draft states that Roe and other subsequent cases wrongly held that abortion uh, is an aspect of liberty protected by the 14th Amendment. So it would explicitly overrule Roe and Casey, which was a critical abortion rights case out of Pennsylvania in 1992, um, and permit states to outright ban abortion. Um, on top of that, virtually any abortion restriction enacted in the states um, would be upheld by federal courts. It'd be very hard to argue in federal court against um, any of the restrictions that lawyers have successfully struck down um, in recent years. Um, and finally, the drafts analytical framework is really concerning for a variety of other rights, the right to contraception, the right to private sexual relations, and even marriage equality could be at risk. Um, so court watchers are, are really concerned with um, the reasoning in this case. So what I'm going to preview next just briefly is what does this mean for Pennsylvania? What's next? Um, and then we can get to the Q&A portion if that sounds good to folks. 
Um, so Mara, if you want to advance this slide, I'll um, dive into um, what things might look like immediately after this decision comes down. Um, so this map is from the Guttmacher Institute and they uh, are attempting to predict how many people might travel, um, not by plane, but um, by car most likely from states that are likely to ban abortion um, following this decision and where, where those folks would go. Um, and so they, you can see in this map, the um, blue states are states where we think abortion access will be safe for the moment. Um, and these orange states are states where we expect abortion to be banned um, pretty quickly. Um, and the gray states are just states that don't happen to border um, a, a state where abortion would be banned and aren't expecting a big influx of patients as a result. Um, but you can see that um, Pennsylvania um, is at least initially expecting to see a big influx of patients. Um, so Guttmacher estimates that um, there, the increase in the percentage of um, women whose nearest abortion provider would be in Pennsylvania is nearly 1,200%. Um, and that's largely from Ohio and West Virginia. And those patients nearest abortion provider um, would be in Pittsburgh. There are two clinics in Pittsburgh. Um, and last month I was on a call with the executive director of one of those clinics who's a provider themselves. And they were sharing that they, uh, they're an independent provider. They were sharing that they currently serve about 3,000 patients a year and they are scaling up, um, hoping to be able to serve 9,000 patients because that's what they're anticipating in terms of an influx um, from neighboring states. So um, you can imagine how challenging that is to triple your capacity and also how challenging it is to support folks who are traveling long distances, as Mara mentioned, um, who likely already have children, um, whose insurance is unlikely to cover their procedure. Um, it's, uh, it's really a logistical nightmare. Um, so that's, uh, regardless of what happens in Pennsylvania politically immediately following this decision, our providers and our abortion funds are really gearing up to see a dramatically increased need um, for care here. And that goes for other regions of the state as well, just because folks might not be driving in from the Cleveland area doesn't mean that people won't be taking cheap direct flights to Philadelphia, uh, for instance, and seeking care uh, at our clinics in Philadelphia. And so we can move on to the next slide, Mara. Um, so as I mentioned, we don't expect that um, Pennsylvania would move immediately to ban abortion following this decision um, or to restrict abortion in, um, in any other way. Um, we anticipate that Governor Wolf would veto any efforts to ban abortion um, or restrict abortion uh, following the Supreme Court ruling as he, does, as he has done for his entire term. So um, we have an anti-choice majority in both the Pennsylvania House and the Pennsylvania Senate as we have for many years, um, but a supermajority or a two thirds vote is required to override the governor's veto. So since Governor Wolf took office in 2015, all of the abortion restrictions that have been passed by the state legislature were um, vetoed. Um, the big question, of course, is what happens in Pennsylvania after Governor Wolf's term ends in January of 2023. So um, I'm sure you all are politically active folks who know that this is a critical gubernatorial race for a lot of reasons. Um, and access to abortion care is one of them. It is one of the areas in which the governor's veto is standing between us and a dramatically different political environment and a dramatically different healthcare environment here in the state. And we can move on to the next slide, Mara. Um, so the 
final thing I think I want to talk about in terms of a political landscape, we'll advance the slides and see what else I have, um, is the prospect of a state constitutional amendment. So um, you heard me say that with the Supreme Court ruling that's coming down the pike, that there may no longer be federal constitutional protections for abortion care. So what our lawyers and lawyers in other organizations around the country are going to be doing is looking to state constitutional protections, right? So if you can't challenge an abortion ban or restriction successfully in federal court anymore, you would want to go to the state courts and argue that um, it contravened the state constitution. Um, unfortunately, um, anti-choice politicians are uh, ahead of us on this and are already thinking about how they can block these challenges. And so we, uh, this year in both the state house and the state Senate, um, there was a state constitutional amendment introduced um, and it states in part, the policy of Pennsylvania is to protect the life of every unborn child from conception to birth. Nothing in this constitution grants or secures any right relating to abortion or the public funding thereof. So that last part is hitting on the Medicaid piece that we talked about. Um, the way that state constitutional amendments work in Pennsylvania, if you're not familiar, I'm afraid you're about to be, um, Republicans in the state legislature have been frustrated that uh, a Democratic governor has been vetoing a lot of their uh, priority bills uh, for the last almost eight years at this point and legislating by constitutional amendment allows them to do an end run around the governor's veto um, because the governor has no role in the process of approving a state constitutional amendment. Um, so this is very smart and strategic and scary. Um, what happens is um, that this uh, bill proposing a state constitutional amendment must pass both the state house and the state senate in two consecutive sessions uh, with identical language and if that happens then um, it would go on the ballot before voters it would be posed as a, a ballot question to voters um, so the earliest that this could possibly uh, appear on the ballot uh, would be in the primary election in May of 2023. Um, but we are hopeful that it won't pass both chambers um, in time this year. Uh, we have two year sessions in Pennsylvania. So we're coming up on the end of a legislative session at the end of 2022. Um, and so if it doesn't pass uh, in time this session, then we would have a little bit of breathing room um, and the earliest it could be on the ballot then would be May of 2025, if that makes sense. So um, that's sort of the window that we're looking at. Um, but this is a pretty uh, scary prospect um, because it really does pave the way for a total abortion ban in Pennsylvania and pulls out from under uh, our team and other lawyers, the prospect of uh, successfully challenging it um, in court. Um, next slide, Mara. Um, so I think we have presented you with enough scary information for one evening. I know a lot of you have been sitting with this and uh, uh, probably on the edge of your seats waiting for the Supreme Court decision to, um, to see what's really next. Um, but I think we want to talk for a moment in the face of all of this distressing news about both the state of access right now and the ways that it's going to get worse, undoubtedly, um, you know, as early as next month. What is it that we can each do um, when I think the political landscape is, is so bleak and it's hard to see a short-term political solution here, right? It's hard to, to see our way um, forward. And so Mar, I might ask you to talk about some of the um, needs for practical support. I think, um, you know, being at a, an organization that works in the courts and in the state legislature, I am increasingly saying, 
Thank you so much for your support. If you want to make abortion access a reality for folks like next month and next year, here's who you need to talk to. And I point to Abortion Liberation Fund. So I'll let Mara take it away. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, something that you can do right now and also when all your friends are, and all the people in your lives are reacting to no matter how what comes out of um, the Supreme Court, we know all the options are devastating. Um, is you can point to donating to your local abortion fund. We are your local abortion fund, but other people in your life who live in other places have one there too. Um, and like Julie said, the getting dollars into the hands of people needing to find a way to get care that week, that month, that year is, um, is what we're doing. So um, no matter what happens, we are, as an organization, will exist in, a, in whatever manner we have to, to get Pennsylvanians access to care, even if an eventuality exists where all of those people are fleeing Pennsylvania and trying to find it elsewhere or finding other means to have abortions themselves at home. Um, so donating to your local abortion fund, also clinic escorting. Um, anytime, I know Julie, you are an expert in this, but anytime the environment becomes even more hostile to abortion, that livens up all the folks that spend their time outside of clinics, the people harassing people in any mode, they feel validated and they feel like they're doing a great job. So when, you, when we hear whatever decision comes about, they'll be thrilled and they'll feel even more emboldened to harass people at clinics. And it takes a special person to be able to support folks directly in person there by escorting. Um, and lots of our local clinics need help with that. Uh, Philadelphia Women's Center almost always needs help. Um, so you can reach out directly to them to support people in person in that way when all the harassers are out and about. For sure. I was just on a call um, with the person who's responsible for security at Planned Parenthood on Locust Street, and she was sharing that already their protesters are um, more emboldened. Um, the There's more of them, but also the harassment that their staff and patients are facing has just been ramped up. Um, it's racist, it's sexist, it's homophobic. Um, and it's, it's really hard to take. Um, so that escort work is really important. Um, I'll also mention um, when we talk about practical support, uh, particularly in Western Pennsylvania, there's gonna be an increased need for support around transportation and childcare and lodging. And there is a new group forming out there um, that is seeking to be able to provide transportation to anyone within 100 miles of Pittsburgh. That's their goal. Um, and so if you know folks out in Western PA um, who are looking to get involved in a, in a hands-on way, um, this is a brand new group that is just forming and trying to figure out um, how to meet this sort of mind-blowing need that they're anticipating out there. Um, and would, would love your support. I'll also share, I was on a call recently, um, it was actually a legislative briefing for friendly lawmakers and I was um, uh, facilitating a panel with providers and one of the, the executive director of the independent clinic in Pittsburgh shared that they drove a patient to Cleveland the previous weekend after the patient's procedure because the patient had no other transportation. Um, and Dr. Ramgapal said that they were headed to Cleveland anyway, so it wasn't you know, entirely out of the way, but that's, you have executive directors who are also doctors and providers driving their patients back to Cleveland because that's already um, what seeking care looks like in Western Pennsylvania. So there's certainly a lot of roles for folks to play um, who are in that part of the state. Um, and then to pivot back to the more uh, political work that is the ACLU's bread and butter, um, we will definitely be doing a lot around um, the gubernatorial race in November. Um, also the Senate race, of course, we don't endorse candidates. I know y'all do. Um, but we do spotlight where the candidates stand on different civil rights and civil liberties issues. 
Um, and we do a lot of work to protect access to voting for folks across the Commonwealth. So that will be um, uh, sort of the next big thing after this Supreme Court decision comes down. Um, we'll have a moment to adapt to serving patients from out of state and figuring out what that looks like. And then we're gonna be walking into a really critical gubernatorial race that could determine whether or not our clinic doors are still open in Pennsylvania come you know, early 2023. Um, and right now the constitutional amendment, uh, it passed out of the Senate Health Committee. It hasn't gotten a floor vote in the Senate. It hasn't moved at all in the House, um, but we are on high alert waiting to see um, if there's movement on that front. Um, and if there is, we don't expect to be able to defeat it in the legislature. We expect that we would be gearing up um, for a big ballot initiative. And so there will be, if, if we have to go down that path, there will be lots of opportunities to plug in um, and to educate your family, friends, neighbors, literally anyone who's registered to vote in Pennsylvania um, about what this constitutional amendment would do. Um, and Mara, I might pass this last one to you as well, because I know this is something that you really support your um, volunteers in doing. Yeah, um, as you can imagine, in the same way that people who oppose abortion access feel emboldened by um, threatening laws, um, abortion stigma, and these laws are able to continue to harm us and continue to make progress because of the stigma that um, we all live in and abortion, abortion is saturated in. Um, so one thing that we always want to mention as a lower lift, you can do it for free thing, is talking about abortion with everyone in your life. Say, say the word abortion and um, be the person that someone can talk to about their own. Um, and just try, we're just trying to make some cultural shifts there. Um, it's important to us. And I think the next slide invites your questions. Yes. Uh, okay, I'd like to uh, remind people that if you have questions to please put them in the chat. Uh, Mara, one person did put in uh, a request that you put in the chat how to make donations to your organization. So please put that in there. And you might say it out loud because the chat uh, won't be in the video uh, that go that gets distributed after this event. Yes. Um, so we are just abortionfundpa.org slash donate. Um, and we so appreciate that support. Um, we're gearing up as, as you heard for a lot. Okay, thank you. Uh, Peggy, you have a question? You have to unmute yourself. Peggy, can you unmute yourself? Tim, do you have to help her? She is her? unmuted. She's not muted. Oh. oh, Peggy, are you there? Okay, we'll come back to her. Yeah, please um, please enter your, your questions in the chat if you have a problem with, it, with, with the speaker. Okay, um, Mara, you indicated that uh, the film is how you used to do things and that you've made changes procedurally and what happens uh, at your organization. Can you please enlighten us as to those changes? Sure. So we've changed a few things to make it easier to get in touch. Um, briefly, you heard me, men someone mentioned to a caller how hard it is to get through the line. Um, it, for many years, we encouraged people to call like they're trying to win a contest on the radio. Um, and no one should have to have that much hassle and hustle to get healthcare. So we changed our um, process to be a voicemail where someone can leave one message and we will return those calls to try to expedite that and lower stress for people. We're also still almost fully remote since COVID. Um, and that's been really helpful, especially for staff um, who are disabled. And so that's um, given a lot more space for us to work. 
Um, and lastly, as adorable as it was, uh, we don't call ourselves Lisa anymore. Um, we use our names and that's been an important shift in really trying to connect more with the people we're talking to um, and releasing some of the anonymity that we held on to. Um, lastly, a big, besides our name changing, um, a big change is that our fund is now staffed by full-time, um, people from Philly and, uh, where we had employed students who were wonderful, but graduated pretty often. Um, so our work is a lot more sustainable in those ways that we can control. Okay. Uh, Julie. Um, black and brown folks are disproportionately impacted by uh, abortion restrictions. Uh, what are leaders in these communities uh, calling for right now? And how can folks outside these communities support uh, their leadership? Thanks for that question, Gloria. I just want to pause for a moment because I do see a question in the chat and I also see Peggy on screen. So I'm wondering <laughs> if we might um, pivot to the question in the chat and Peggy before we get to that. Okay. All right. Uh, Peggy, do you want to jump in if you are yes. able to? Well, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Fine. I, it, it looked like you could hear me before. So one is a one is a comment and one is a question. The comment is that I've seen language that I love very dearly, which is that when the decision comes down, rather than calling an you know, anti Roe v. Wade or abortion restriction, that it is a forced birth decision. And I love that language that what we're looking at now is that the court decided on forced birth. And I think if we can adopt it in some ways or the ways in which you can figure how to nuance it, it's better language because it's what it is. And anyway, so that's the statement. And the second question, the question is, I have seen that somewhere, I believe in the South, a Jewish uh, collective has brought a court case on religious freedom, because for those of us who are Jews, life begins at birth, it does not begin at, at conception. And I wonder if you guys can speak to whether you think that's going to happen. And, and then when we got yesterday, the main case, which is maybe the most scary thing that's happened in my lifetime, except <laughs> for the reverse of abortion. Um, I wonder if this court can stand in two different places and allow the main, but not allow the Jews, which will be stunning, but I'm done. <laughs> Thanks, Peggy. And maybe you'll translate that in case I'm not, I think I'm not being clear about what that case was and what the, what the legal standing is. Thanks. Oh my gosh. Mara, it sounded like you were nodding along. Did you have anything you wanted to jump in with? No, no, I just know what you're talking about, Peggy. <laughs> yeah, so um, I always uh, predicate my uh, talks or workshops or presentations with, I work for the ACLU, but I'm not a lawyer. Um, so I'm going to say that again. Um, I'm a social worker by training, and um, I th th that's a fantastic question, Peggy, and I would want to talk in greater depth with some of our legal experts about it. I think the ACLU would be really uniquely positioned um, to think about um, how to move forward with those types of religious freedom challenges because we have done that First Amendment work around freedom of religion and belief. Uh, since our founding 100 years ago. And we also have litigated uh, abortion uh, restrictions in states all across the country. So this sounds like one of those moments when I'm really um, glad to work at the ACLU at a multi-issue organization where there's the expertise about how um, our different rights might intersect and how to make um, novel arguments uh, to protect our rights when they're really at risk. But I, I would agree, uh, you know, uh, the, I haven't even read a whole lot about the decision that came down yesterday around uh, religious freedom in the, in the case that came out of Maine. But, um, but 
it's, it seems like a scary time to be bringing those types of uh, freedom of religion and belief cases to the Supreme Court too. But I, I guess, first of all, hi, I'd love to both of you. It's lovely to see you again. Um, but, but more than that, I think that the notion of, I think it's a very interesting wrinkle. And I think the case is brought in Florida um, by the Jewish community that, wait, no, you can't do this to us because you're depriving us of religious liberty. And it strikes me as, a, as quite an interesting act, you know, something to be, for us to be watching as, an, as a very unexpected access point Definitely. in this conversation. I mean, I had no idea that that, that would come up and it strikes me as quite fascinating. Definitely, and, particularly given that abortion opponents often wield their religious beliefs um, in conversation in an attempt to uh, impose their religious beliefs on others through abortion restrictions. So I love the idea of giving them a taste of their own medicine from the other side of things. Yeah, I know I um, was coordinating with our sibling fund in Tampa because they have a 15 week abortion ban that'll go in effect on July 1st, regardless of Roe um, and coordinating people possibly flying up here. And I'm curious to see if that will have anything to, to help um, in the meantime. For sure. Tim, did you want to say something else? Yeah, what? hi. So I just wanted to see, CC put a comment in here. I, I was wondering if you could answer it. She says, I'm familiar with abortion services offered by Planned Parenthood and hospitals, but I didn't know there were any or many freestanding clinics. Are there any? So the majority of abortions are done at independent clinics in this country. In fact, um, a much higher percentage than those performed at Planned Parenthood's. And in fact, it's our independent providers, at least around here, but pretty much for the most case, who are able to serve folks later into pregnancy as opposed to Planned Parenthood who might stop earlier in the gestation, even if the state would allow them to go further. And so as we're thinking about people having their care delayed, um, and we know that anytime you restrict abortion, you're just pushing the abortion further out of reach. And often that just means further in time, if you can get one at all. And so more than ever, it's going to be the independent abortion providers, the freestanding clinics who are serving the boatload of people needing care. And that's already true now um, in Philadelphia and the whole state and the whole country. And just right. to name them, if you want to learn more about them, the women's centers um, are have clinics in Philadelphia, in Delaware County, and in Cherry Hill, um, as well as Connecticut and Georgia, um, but three very close uh, to here. And then um, you have the Allentown Women's Center, um, which is actually located in Bethlehem, and not only provides abortion care, but also provides uh, transgender health care, uh, things like hormone replacement therapy for trans folks. Um, and then you have Allegheny Reproductive Health Care in Pittsburgh, which is the clinic I named earlier as scaling up to serve triple the number of patients and whose executive director was driving a patient home to Cleveland last weekend. So um, I don't know if I'm missing any, Mara, but those are the big three in independent providers that I think of in the state. So if I give, <clears throat> excuse me, um, if I give money to you all, um, to ALF, then does it go only to independent um, clinics or does it also go to Planned Parenthood? Um, my, I know about abortions in hospitals, the, the really late ones, because my daughter's a nurse anesthetist and she's one of the few on the staff who can deal with with helping these women so late in their pregnancies when they've just discovered something really, really awful about the baby. Um, like, you know, almost no, ha only half a heart or whatever, half a brain. Um, so yeah, so if I give you all money, wh whom exactly do you fund? Yeah, we work with every abortion provider in the area that serves low income people. So if we don't fund them, it's probably because they only take insurance for people or for some reason, low income people aren't going there. And so when you picture where the money 
is going. It's less, it's more so that you're helping to cover the bill for someone wherever they choose to go. And it's about split in Philly of whether the person's going to go to a Planned Parenthood or that we talk to a Planned Parenthood somewhere in our half of the state and then um, the independent providers. So it depends where they have their appointment. And it's kind of like reaching the paying the tab for them before they get there. So does the do your fund does your does your funding go directly to the provider or to the patient? Directly to the provider. So that way, as the call ends, the person doesn't have to do anything else. They just show up and their appointments cheaper. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you for this education. Uh, by the way, I just wanted to throw out there, I'm, I'm turning 70 soon and I live at a retirement community and we do a lot of rallies and demonstrations. It's a really liberal retirement community. And I just bought a handmaid's tail outfit. Um, to wear the, the whole red outfit and the bonnet to wear to the demonstrations. There you well, go. Cece, we're giving you a call because we're going to use you at some some event. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll be. Your handmaid. Okay, <laughs> that's going to come in handy. <laughs> um, Jean Claire mentioned uh, mentioned abortion pills. We haven't spoken about that. Uh, probably you both have something to say about this. How will the availability of telemedicine and medication abortion affect access for folks uh, around the country and particularly in Pennsylvania. Do you wanna take that one, Julie, to start? Sure, I can start there. So um, right now about half of per abortions um, that take place in the United States um, happen via medication abortion. It's a combination of two pills um, that allow someone to end a pregnancy um, really in the comfort of their own home, right? Um, and so this is a big change from the pre-row days. I think uh, a lot of folks are looking at this moment and going, oh my gosh, we're, it, we're, it's like we're gonna be transported back to 1970. Um, but in fact, the availability of medication abortion um, the prevalence of telehealth. And then also I was saying to folks uh, before everybody got on the call, the existence of the internet makes it a very different landscape for folks um, who may live in states where abortion will be criminalized and who are seeking care. Um, so that said, I, those folks will be in states where abortion is illegal, but not necessarily unavailable or inaccessible, right? Um, I, we're anticipating a lot of movement in state legislatures to try to ban abortion by telemedicine. Some of that has already happened. Um, to try to ban the mailing of um, abortion pills to in-state addresses. Uh, to try to ban transporting um, this medication across state lines. There's a whole variety of ways in which I think this is going to be tied up in litigation going forward. And uh, we know from the pre-road days that folks are uh, resolute when they make a decision to have an abortion. We know folks are creative. We know folks are connected. Um, and that, you know, there's going to be... Um, a community that comes together to provide this care, whether folks are choosing um, to have an in-clinic procedure or whether folks are opting for medication abortion. So uh, that doesn't give you a definitive answer. I think we're kind of waiting to see how it plays out, um, but it it does, it will entail a legal risk uh, to folks who are involved. And I think that's one of the things that we are gearing up for and trying to think about um, from a, uh, you know, sort of in the political space is how do we protect abortion seekers from this type of criminalization, um, which has been happening across the country already. We had a case in Pennsylvania of a mom whose 16 year old got pregnant and she ordered uh, abortion pills online, had them shipped to her, gave them to her daughter um, and then her daughter started bleeding and she was concerned that maybe this was atypical. She took her daughter to the emergency room. This was about 75 miles outside of Harrisburg, which is why she opted to go this route. She wasn't able to get her daughter to a clinic. Um, 
and they wound up calling the police, calling Child Protective Services, um, and she served an, the mom served an 18 month sentence, um, even though it turned out her daughter was totally fine and the bleeding she was experiencing was a normal part of the process. Um, and this was, I want to say this was in 2013 or 2014. It's been a while ago. Um, but I think we're going to see increased surveillance of pregnant people, increased surveillance of pregnancy outcomes that are anything other than the birth of a healthy full-term baby, um, and increased surveillance of abortion seekers. So, um, it's both very promising. It's a very promising avenue for folks to be able to um, really self-manage abortion at home. And we don't want to stigmatize that. We don't want to um, imply that it's unsafe because it's actually pretty safe um, at this point. If you are confident that you got the correct medication and you follow the protocols. Um, however, it is criminalized. So the the concern is not really about the person's health um, so much as it is about um, the criminal legal system stepping in um, to prosecute them for seeking to end a pregnancy. And I don't know if that answered the question at all. That was a, a lot of <laughs> no, <laughs> maybe about what direction this could go. Um, and I, th I think it's, it's going to be one of the more interesting things to follow as we move forward to see to what extent we can um, we can make this a, an option for folks. Mara, maybe maybe you can address uh, what if any restrictions already exist uh, in Pennsylvania on uh, obtaining this type of abortion. Well, all the same ones. Um, I, if you're obtaining a medication abortion through a clinic legally, it's all of the same restrictions and all of the same hurdles, um, unless you're able to use telemedicine instead of getting all the way to a clinic. Um, but that's not so vastly available anyways. So you're still making the trip out anyways. Um, yeah, I think, I feel like it co you covered it, Julie. The FDA did just, uh, following uh, sustained advocacy from the ACLU and probably others, lift a requirement that the medication abortion be obtained in person from a physician. So that could open doors to um, other options that are permissible under FDA regulations, at least. Um, but we have to see how that plays out in states. And I'm Jean sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name, but I saw you come on camera and come off mute. And I want to invite you to ask a follow-up question, Jean-Claire. Hi, yes, Jean-Claire. Um, Jean yes, thank you for answering my question. Um, my follow-up question was the woman that, um, uh, who assisted her daughter in, in gaining an abortion, under what current law is what she did illegal? How was how she charged? That's a great question, and I would have to look back at the case. I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, I think it might have been substance or dr dr like moving the drugs around or something. Yeah, um, the, the pill she ordered uh, came from out of the country, so I think, um, uh, you know, they probably were not legally obtained, although she, I'm guessing she ordered them off of Amazon or something like that. But I would have to look back at the case to tell you what um, what charges she pled to. I would guess there was a child endangerment charge there, whether, um, but I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, yeah, I'm I'm um, absorbing everything I heard tonight, and I'm really. I was angry before, so now I'm just <laughs> additionally angry. And I'm, um, you know, I'm th thinking about how do we, um, knowing that it's not an if, it's a when, how do we, um, who are the, the organizing bodies that are going to work to take our reproductive rights in our own hands, regardless of, uh, criminalization, assuming criminalization, including Pennsylvania, and, and what, um, what partnership relationships might we have with other countries to help, uh, help um, American women 
with the um, reproductive uh, access that they need. Jean Claire, I'm going to take. I'm going to. I'm going to fight back on that. I I fought 50 years ago for Roe, and um, and I'm not saying it's going to be a win. It might be an if, but we won 50 years ago. We're going to win again. We're going to we're going to elect Democrats and liberal minded people and it's it's gonna it's gonna be even if they take it away now damn it we're gonna fight again and win uh, i i'm an optimist but we have a, the supreme court that we have we, we have don't have, only, the decision we have yet. excuse me we have only the governor in pennsylvania yep. um and and we have uh we have we are years if not many other obstacles away from uh, flipping the Pennsylvania legislator, and there are people on this call that know um, the ins and outs much better than I do. So, um, so in parallel to these these uh, laws that are being uh, perpetrated on us, um, we we have to take re reproductive access into our own hands and draw from previous generations, including the Jane Collective, on how to conduct abortions with or without legal rights. I think it's really a both and situation, right? I think you're both correct that the day after the Supreme Court decision comes down, people in this country are gonna need abortion care. And that may mean taking this into their own hands. That may mean getting really creative about how we as a community come together and provide care. And we don't wanna be doing this forever, right? Like Mara said, when Women's Medical Fund was founded in 1985, they were envisioning a future in which they wouldn't be necessary. And unfortunately we haven't gotten there yet, but I think we have to hold that vision as you're saying, Cece, um, and think about how do we um, create the political climate that we want so that we don't have to keep um, taking things into our own hands, uh, figuring out these workarounds, um, stepping in because the state is failing to do its job. Um, so I, Jean Claire, I will have to look, I have um, somewhere in my email, a list of resources uh, around self-managed abortion and also um, legal defense for folks who might be um, assisting folks with abortion care or, um, self-managing their own abortions. And so uh, I can try to send that uh, around after the call, uh, but there's definitely groups, um, at least nationally who are stepping into that space and trying to be a resource for people wherever they are in the country who are um, taking that path. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate that. I'm wondering if you have any uh, suggestions for us of uh, coalitions forming to try and counter uh, the anticipated actions, um, either statewide or locally, that people should be aware of? That's a great question. Um, here's what I can share with you. Folks may be aware that ooh, maybe three days after uh, the Supreme Court um, draft leaked, uh, Philadelphia City Council passed a resolution calling for joint committee hearings on um, what the fall of Roe might mean for Philadelphia, for residents and non-residents seeking abortion care. And so right now there's a small group of um, advocates and healthcare providers um, who are coming together to think about what issues we want to lift up at these hearings and where um, city council might be able to provide additional support and protection to pregnant people, to abortion seekers and to providers. Um, and so that's the very beginning stages. We've had one meeting so far, but we'll definitely be um, seeking um, to expand uh, the scope of involvement and engage folks um, in pushing uh, city council to take whatever actions they're able to take locally. Um, so Is that's here on this side of the state. And then I'll say uh, I'm also involved in a coalition space that is a little enormous and unwieldy in Western Pennsylvania that's really about coordinating care out there by and large. 
Um, but I, I suspect that's not applicable to folks on this call. Okay. Uh, does anyone else have any topics they want our speakers to address? I wanted to ask you a question, Julie. Um, yeah. The when when will will we know if we got past the safe point with the constitutional amendment to maybe last out until 2025? Uh, I believe the date is August 10th. And I was trying not to get too deep in the weeds, um, but the bill has to pass both um, the state house and the state senate 90 days or more before the next election. And so I think that August 10th is 90 days out from November 8th. And of course, the state legislature usually recesses after they pass the budget at the end of June until September. So, you know, I'll breathe a small sigh of relief after they leave for the summer. And then after August 10th, then I'll really go, whew, yeah. um, and figure, okay, we've got a little bit of a grace period to, to plan around this. Gotcha. And lastly, I heard that when something goes to the ballot, like, isn't it like nine times out of 10, we pass ballot and it, like we always pass them, right? People just say yes to things. Yeah, I think um, it's interesting. There are something like 92 constitutional amendments that the legislature is considering right now. Our legislative director, Liz, is tracking all of them and it's absolutely bananas. Um, and the default is people vote yes on what appears on the ballot. And they, um, with our partners, uh, we did a couple of focus groups. And I guess the, the assumption that voters have is that this is something that's been carefully considered and vetted by the legislature. And so sure, let's do it. When in fact, um, these bills can pass without the committee holding hearings without really any formal opportunity for public input and just land on the ballot. Um, and so there's a whole group of folks who are concerned about a whole variety of issues that um, could wind up on the ballot because of this constitutional amendment nonsense that's happening in Harrisburg, who are thinking about how do we message to voters, vote no, vote no, vote no, vote no, uh, because that's by and large, uh, where progressive organizations are with a lot of these constitutional amendments. Yeah. Okay, this has been really informative. And as we know, knowledge helps to fight fear. So hopefully, uh, we will all help spread information to the public uh, about how and where to get uh, help for those seeking abortions and motivate us uh, to continue to advocate for control over our bodies and justice for all. So I want to thank Julie Zapes and Mara Lang for sharing their knowledge, insight, and wisdom. Uh, if we didn't get to anyone's question, uh, let us know and we'll try and get an answer for you. Uh, the recording of this evening's presentation will be on our website, philly, P-H-I-L-L-Y, N-N.org. Uh, it's also gonna be on our YouTube site and on our Facebook page. So please direct your friends and neighbors as to how to see it. And thank you all for joining us tonight and have a good evening. Thank you. Thanks so much.